Um, next, uh, we have our uh, our last speaker for today's conference is uh, Dr. Shailesh Kumar. Um, he is the chief data scientist uh, of Reliance Geo and also the program mentor of AINDS uh, at Geo Institute. Um, he has published over 20 international papers and book chapters and holds more than 20 patents in AI and ML. And he was recognized as one of the top data scientists in India in 2015 by the Analytics India magazine. He was formerly uh, the vice president Ola, where he worked on several computer science, machine learning, AI and optimization issues. He was also the chief data scientist uh, and co-founder of Third Leap, uh, an edtech startup that uses AI to create personalized math guides. Prior to this, Dr. Kumar worked at Google on a variety of products uh, uh, at Google. Uh, over to you, sir. Yeah, thank you. And thank you, Dr. Nilay, for organizing this. Um, you know, as I was listening to the conversation, um, there are very beautiful themes that were emerging. And, you know, uh, hope uh, a lot of us have taken some of those themes. Uh, but let me just summarize how I see the future of AI in the next 10 years. And uh, uh, more importantly, the kind of skill sets we are going to need to develop to become ready for the next 10 years of AI, right? And uh, uh, so, so one of the uh, most important uh, things that is emerging is that AI and data science is truly becoming a horizontal. And when I say horizontal, I mean it in every sense of the word horizontal. Uh, so for you, if you look at the different industries that are using it, right? Today we saw examples of how Otis is using, IBM is using, Swiggy is using, and healthcare is using, uh, the media and news uh, industry is using, but this is a very small sample of where AI is being used now. 20 years ago, when we talked about AI, we were only thinking about Google search engine or you know Yahoo search engine, but now AI is all pervasive across all industries. So if you look at the banking industry, how they do credit scoring, and how the financial institutions decide how to optimize their portfolio, how the insurance companies mm -hmm. detect frauds and, and uh, you know optimize their risk, uh, how the retail companies do a lot of things with AI, including recommendations and, 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 and optimization, um, how telecom companies are using AI to figure out how to optimize the telecom network, how media companies like you know Netflix and all are using AI uh, to, to do a lot of personalization, understanding what kind of content people like. Uh, even the fashion industry is catching up, and now you have uh, fashion experts as AI uh, in the background that is telling you what goes with what. Uh, there's a lot of manufacturing industry that is using AI to optimize their manufacturing mm -hmm. processes. Uh, we saw an example of health care has going to be a very, very big area for AI all the way from how do we do preclinical diagnosis, postclinical diagnosis, uh, manage healthcare in a proactive manner with Fitbit, uh, take care of uh, you know cancer, uh, drug discovery, gene therapy, all kinds of areas within healthcare. Um, agriculture is going to be a very big area. How do we think about uh, you know personalizing the, uh, uh, the advisories to a farmer, uh, and optimizing the supply chain for agriculture. Uh, education, we are going to see a lot of transformation in uh, you know bringing personalized education at scale to all the kids. How do you do curriculum personalization, content personalization, and uh, you know problem and homework personalization. Uh, smart cities are going to see a lot of uh, you know embedding of AI across you know whether it is safety and security whether it is you know energy and and telecom and water supply or whether it is uh, uh, sustainability and climate change right so uh, and we saw examples of how ai is bringing a lot of convenience to us in terms of uh, you know whether it is ola uber or swiggy zomato or you know netmets and all of that uh, so it's amazing that what we predicted ai was going to do 20 years ago we predicted that it is actually going to pervade all industries um, is now coming true. And uh, we are still, you know, in the early stages, uh, we are still solving a few problems with AI in few industries, but I think this is going to become a complete picture uh, in the next decade. Uh, so one of the great benefits of being a data scientist is 
to be able to learn a lot about different industries. And, and that is one of our, uh, uh, you know, we cannot pick and choose a vertical. The vertical has to choose us and we have to learn how to embed AI in that vertical. So this is one of the critical skill sets that we are vertical agnostic. Principles of AI and data science are vertical agnostic uh, and how do we apply them to all verticals is one of the ways of thinking about it. Second notion of horizontal is, uh, you know, it has to work across all types of data. It has to work across transaction data, whether it is point of sale or payment or insurance or banking transaction. It has to work across IoT data, whether it is coming from time series or your Fitbit or your stock market uh, or your seismographs. Uh, it has to work across images and videos, whether it comes from YouTube or TikTok or from medical images or from security videos. Uh, it has to work across speech whether the speech is used for identifying who you are, uh, what are you saying, what is your health, um, uh, you know, Alexa, Siri, a uh, lot of healthcare applications of speech. Uh, it has to work across languages. Uh, Larry showed a great example of how you can generate language stories. Uh, it has to work on understanding language, generating language, summarizing language, you know, all of that. And it has to work across other data types like genomics data, uh, remote sensing data, and so on. So this is the second notion of horizontal, that AI is going to be a data agnostic and a vertical agnostic uh, horizontal, right? And we cannot, again, pick and choose the data type we like. We have to be able to apply the same principles across all data types and across all verticals. So these are the two big horizontals. The third big horizontal in AI that I see is uh, it will be used in many different ways, right? So uh, it, it will be used to interpret the data, whether it is text data you are interpreting, video you are interpreting, gene sequence you are interpreting. It is going to be used to predict what is going to happen in the future, whether it is demand forecasting, whether it is a heart attack coming to a person, whether a crop is going to fail, whether a customer is going to churn. So prediction, interpretation, uh, you know, demand forecasting, supply optimization uh, is a very big area where all the companies like Zomato, Swiggy, Ola, Uber, NetMeds, uh, you know, uh, food delivery and all of that is going to need a lot of those optimizations. Uh, personalization is another area that is going to really change the way we think about not only commercial sectors. So today, our Netflixes and our YouTubes and our uh, uh, Twitter are realized uh, and Goda talked about how even our Swiggies are personalized and now it is going to move further into you know personalized for farmers personalized uh, education for uh, for students and personalized medicines and treatments for patients right so personalization is going to go on uh, search and discovery is one big area we started with Google but now we search uh, songs using a hum humming tune or we search uh, uh, food in a food app, or we search uh, apps in an app store. So search is becoming a very big horizontal. Uh, another big area is the anomaly detection, which is, you know, how do you know that something is wrong? A fraud, or is it a spam? And, uh, you know, is it a fraud in the credit card or a company and all of that? So how do we think about anomaly detection, recommendation engines? Uh, and personalization go hand in hand. We have seen what they can do, but now it's going to go into more social sectors also. And we talked about optimization. And last is generative AI, right? Now AI is going to be able to not only understand the data, but generate uh, text or generate images or generate uh, stories and all of that, right? So I think the, uh, the this is the third horizontal where we cannot pick and choose what kind of AI we want to learn. It's a horizontal. It's like saying, a, uh, 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 you know, a carpenter cannot pick and choose and say, I only want to learn hammer and I'll be a... So we have to learn all the tools. In that sense, the onus on the, the depth and breadth of what a data scientist has to learn is increasing every year because new technologies are coming, new data types are coming, new verticals are starting to adopt AI. So the scope of what AI is going to do and the scope of what we as data scientists have to learn is exponentially growing as, and I see this becoming very, very 
uh, important and a very deep uh, skill to have in the future. Right? And some of the principles I have learned um, uh, over the last 20 years, uh, you know, we, we as data scientists, we start to ask the wrong question first, which is, where is the data? Uh, you know, what model should I build? And then how to deploy it? Uh, I think we need to work backwards from, uh, you know, customers and not forward from technology. This is one of the principles we learned in design thinking that as technologists in the IT era, we wanted to build great apps and products, but we never worked backward from customer and say, will this work for this customer? And uh, how do we make it customer backward? So this is a new skill that we'll have to develop uh, as a data scientist also, which is how do we work backwards from the customer, identify the pain point, and the customer could be a person, it could be a hospital, it could be a school, it could be a, a security agency, whoever is the customer, how do we work backwards, listen to the pain points, uh, and then create a framework? That is an important skill uh, in top of what uh, else we talked about. Second is how do we work backwards from decisions and metrics and not forward from data? Again, we start with data, but that's not the wrong starting point. We need to work backwards from decisions. So in my different careers and pathways, I, I learned that the first question I ask is not to the data guy and say, where is the data? I, I go to the product manager, to the business leaders first and ask them, you know, what kind of decisions do you make on a daily basis? How do you make those decisions? Why do you make those decisions? What are the metrics you are tracking? And then we work backwards and try to figure out, therefore, what kind of models we need to build and what kind of data we need. So it's always working backwards from decisions. And the third thing is, how do we work backward from solutions and not forward from models? We are very excited about building the models, deploying the models, improving the accuracy of the models. So data scientists today have become very model-centric thinkers. Uh, and there are tools to do auto ML. Uh, it's a very creative process, I understand. I think we need to expand the scope and, and ask ourselves, why are we building this one model? And is this one model enough to solve the entire problem? And now if we start to think about not solving one problem at a time, but taking care of the entire ecosystem. And Goda showed how, for example, within Swiggy, the whole solution needs many, many types of models, right? All the way from search and personalization and optimization and pricing and managing human resources, uh, predicting and demand forecasting. So it's it's a solution thinking and then deciding the architecture of models that we need uh, is the new skill that we'll have to de develop. So instead of being a bottom-up data scientist, we need to start becoming a top-down data scientist. And uh, you know this, uh, so, so at Geo Institute, what we have done is we have looked at these future skills, right? The exhaustiveness, the breadth and the depth of uh, the different verticals, different data types, different types of decisions, different types of modeling uh, frameworks. And, and on top of it, we have added a whole other skills like design thinking, uh, you know, solution thinking, uh, and saying, I don't want to just build a uh, one little uh, model, but I want to think, how do I create a personalized advisory for a farmer? And I'm going to need many, many skills. I'm going to need to know how to do speech to text, text to intent, knowledge graph and reasoning, you know, get the data from different sources, uh, come up with an advisory, generate the text out of it, generate the speech out of it. So solution thinking is a very horizontal skill that we need to start developing. System thinking, another very important thing that we do is we deal with boxes, but we don't connect the boxes properly. And this is going to be a very important skill because large complex ecosystems like telecom, like retail, like uh, you know, food delivery or, or uh, running a healthcare system of a country, trivial things. These are very, very complex ecosystems uh, you know, the, the thought process that we have developed that how to build a search engine is not going to work anymore because we have to think about APIs. Given a query, what should be the result? Given a query, what should be the ad? Search engine is a two API system. In the future, the next 10 years, we are going to build a thousand API system, like a telecom network or a retail or an agriculture of a country. 
So our system thinking has to develop and we cannot build those systems if we don't know how to connect the boxes. The output of which model has to go to the input of which model, which sensor has to be connected to which, which model on the input side, which decision system has to connect to which kind of a model. So this system thinking is going to become a very important skill set. Uh, another skill set that I see that needs to be developed is formulation thinking, where the problem is that on one side, we are learning a lot of tools. On the other side, the business is telling us a lot of pain points, but the people who are supposed to connect the tools to the business problems are missing because we are either pure data scientists who know very good Python and, and modeling, or we are purely a business person or a product person who understands customer and market and metrics, but the people who need to bridge that gap have to come from both sides. So product managers have to become data scientists, at least to some extent, and data scientists have to think like product managers to some extent. And only then we'll start to talk each other's language and become formulation thinker. So these are some of the areas that, you know, at Geo Institute, we are uh, trying to create a program which is very holistic, uh, both on skill, theoretical understanding, intuitive understanding, applications, and putting a system and a solution together. End to end, if we can do that, then I think we can attain the requirements of the next 10 years with the skill sets that we want to develop today. Yeah. So thank you for your time. And it was a wonderful session. I learned a lot from different speakers and uh, hopefully we'll do more of this and see a lot more participation. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. And so we cannot uh, leave you without a few questions. So there are some questions that have come come for you. So I'll uh, there are just a couple of questions. So the first question says that um, will AI deployment be a threat to humans' personalized data collection and security? Yeah, very good question. I think you know we all worry about it, uh, and then we realize that there is a very nice trade-off. And as long as there are the right regulations, and Dr. Zia talked about you know in the scenario of healthcare the right regulations if you put in place then we don't need to worry about it because uh, you know as long as for example a healthcare app doesn't sell the students education historical data to a employment company or to a college right so when we use the right data for the right use cases deliberately create the right when we separate the identity of the user from the behavior we see in the data, then we are very good in personalizing. Uh, you know, I worked at uh, in Gmail, for example, where we worked with very, very personal data of users, and there are very, very high standards on how, uh, who can access, and even if you know that you can access, you don't know who the person is, right? So I think the standards will come from medical industry, uh, from, you know, such, industries like Gmail and all that. Uh, and with GDPR coming in, India is going to have a very strong, uh, you know, personalized uh, so, sort of privacy preserving policy. So uh, yes, we have made a lot of mistakes in the past. We are still learning. Technology is always ahead of regulation. I think this is one thing that history has taught us that, uh, you know, uh, unless technology decides to make a mistake, the regulation doesn't catch up with it, right? We had to uh, you know, put nuclear weapons on, on two cities before the non-proliferation treaty was signed, right? So same thing will happen in AI. It's a very new technology. We are going to learn how can it be misused and then create regulation. And uh, privacy is one of them. There are many other such things like bias and prejudice that can come in. So is it fair? Is it made fair? Uh, you know, uh, is the use case threatening to humanity, right? Use case of AI, for example, in, in warfare is, is, is something that is of great concern to a lot of people. Uh, AI drones running around with weapons is not a good uh, sign. And so, yes, there are a lot of, you know, like they say, with great power comes great responsibility. I think uh, as data scientists, we have to learn the art also to say no to certain things and say, I, I will not do you know, for example, uh, one of my life experiences was we built a recommendation engine and somebody wanted us to deploy it in the casinos in, in Las Vegas to help uh, people play more games. And I said, no, I am not going to do that, right? So we have to learn the art of saying no also because there is an ethical and a moral responsibility also that comes with 
this kind of a skill set that we are developing. So, uh, great question, but I just expanded the scope of the question. And, uh, you know, that aspect is now becoming very important. There are whole courses on ethical AI, uh, which we also have. And these courses will develop further as new regulations come. And I think we have to use our ethical standards to see if, if somebody would do it to me, uh, should I or not to others, right? And that will be the most fundamental thing. And uh, yes, uh, it will be an important area of discussion for a long Thank time. you. Thank you, sir. So you spoke about the horizontal scope of AI. Um, so the next question is related to that, which says that can, I, can AI be utilized for tax purpose, especially for tax planning? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Very good question. And I teach, uh, you know, a lot of uh, tax people come uh, to ISV and we do, you know, AI courses for them. So within the taxation world, there are a lot of use cases uh simulation so when the tax policy is formulated what ai can do looking at past data it can say that if you change this lab this way what will happen how many new people will come into the thing and all of that so policy creation for taxation is one big area where ai can help second is you know catching uh, people who are doing tax evasion or tax fraud of this kind or that kind this is one big area then uh, my favorite area is uh, like you said, tax planning. Uh, tax planning can still be done, uh, you know, as a chartered accountant can help a human do tax planning uh, given the input. Similarly, AI can do exactly the same thing, right? So chartered accountant as a service, as a, an AI service example, right? And one of the ways to think about AI is to say, here is an expert of type X. Can I convert that expert to X? So if you are a great doctor, can I create an AI doctor? If you are a great chartered accountant, can I create an AI equivalent? If you are a great uh, musician, can I create an AI music? So, so the, or a fashion designer and all that. So I think uh, this is definitely going to happen. But my favorite problem statement I give to the tax people is, imagine that there is no such thing as end of the year taxation. With every transaction that is happening digitally, you know, TDS is already automated, but if I make a donation to a ATC organization, automatically the system should know that my tax burden is now reduced by this much and automatically my next TDS should reflect that. This kind of thought process is very important that today because of silos of TDS system is separate, tax inspection is separate, you know, tax filing is separate. Because of these silos, we are not able to do it. But with technologies like blockchain coming that is saying, I will know exactly who paid how much, nobody can dispute. And then I can connect all the dots. Every payment is digital, whether it is salary or purchase. Uh, then we are ready. Now we are ready to actually leapfrog the whole taxation system so that nobody has to actually pay taxes. Every month your taxes are resolved because whatever you do, if you show profit or loss in a business, that gets resolved in the next few months. If you show, you know, donations, that gets resolved. So somehow the process of taxation, it is tedious and very, you know, uh, weird, but this is one area where I think it can be uh, magical if we put a whole system together and somebody bold has to take that call and say, we are going to do this, yeah. Uh, so our last question for you is that uh, uh, we have uh, different international consortiums like 3GPP in telecom or RISC, we in process of designing. Uh, what are consortium working for the standardization of AI models and their interoperability? Because uh, we see different frameworks like TensorFlow popping up. Um, so how will they be connected together so that models from different frameworks can be used in, in another framework? Yeah, this is a very good question. I think there are two big uh, areas in the standardization that have to happen. One is the data standardization, right? Today, even the way we store a data set, we have many, many ways to store data, transmit data, uh, compress data and all of that. So I think standardization has to come uh, both on the data side as well as the API side. And even today, you are right, when I look at the same API Google, on Amazon and, and uh, Microsoft, the three big data uh, AI providers, even they don't agree on what is the API going to be for speech to text. 
in a language, right? So you are absolutely right. Uh, industries that have leapfrogged, like telecom, for example, where we have created 2G, 2G is a standard, 3G is a standard, 4G is a standard, 5G is a standard. And people on the standardization of that vertical, only then, you know, you can have an international call between one device in one operating system with one telecom provider to another telecom provider to another device in another operating system, right? And therefore, standardization is the next big thing that will happen. Uh, you know, we are taking a stab, open AI uh, kind of community is taking a stab. Uh, TM Forum is there for telecom. Now they're going to expand their scope and say standardization, not only in the telecom world, but also in the AI world. Uh, so there are many, again, bottom up efforts uh, in the world of standardization and regulation, uh, both on the data side and on the AI side. And we're going to see when that happens well. And this doesn't happen uh, because one guy wants to dominate the space. I think all the AI pro, you know, partners have to come together, sit down like, like the telecom partners have to sit down and come up with the standards. So same thing will happen here. And this, uh, this has happened in the uh, past also, right? MP4, MP3 were standards that were discussed between the Sonys of the world to then come up with a single standard. So you can play whatever type of file on whatever type of device. So, uh, you know, these standardizations are important and AI is uh, not behind. And especially because of the diversity of AI, how we use it across data sets, across verticals, across use cases, this is becoming a bigger and bigger realization across industries and within industry also people are not standardizing. So yes, we need to kill these silos and uh, bring all the data and the decisions and the process in between into a single standard framework. Only then we can kind of leapfrog, um, uh, you know, the system thinking around, around AI. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Shailesh, for, uh, uh, for that session. And this brings us to the end of our virtual conference. And uh, before we leave, I'd request uh, Dr. Nilay Agnik uh, to deliver the vote of thanks. Um, thank you, Ritu. Um, you know, a few months back, around um, towards the end of July, in fact, um, I got together with Dr. Larry and Dr. Shailesh. And um, we were just thinking and started to brainstorm and think thought there should be some kind of a session where uh, we kind of work towards demystifying and make people aware about the usage of, of uh, AI. <clears throat> so one of the, uh, uh, so we kept on thinking as to what we should do. And uh, finally, we thought that let's start off with AI in business. And what will AI look like in the next decade in business? And that's how this whole conference uh, came up as such. Uh, we will hold several other programs also, but which will now be specific, sectoral specific. So AI in healthcare, maybe a program or a workshop or a, a, a seminar on AI in healthcare, AI in education, um, AI for society, AI in agriculture. We plan to hold such kind of programs. Over and above that, we also plan to hold programs not necessarily AI, but aspects which will impact the society as a whole and different sectors of the society. So you will soon hear about that as well. And uh, I'd, I'd like to invite uh, people here because our uh, executive uh, center and the residences for executives who will be coming here to uh, learn uh, and to participate in such programs will soon be ready. And you are all most welcome to visit our campus and spend a few days here and uh, participate in our next range of uh, management development programs. There are so many people I wish to thank uh, to make this conference so enlightening and um, you know, invigorating. So um, firstly, I wish to thank all the speakers who spend so much of their time with us, uh, people from US, people from Europe, people from India, all of uh, people, you know, specifically, I wish to thank, uh, of course, uh, Dr. Padmanad Seshashayar, Dr. Ravi Vadapalai, Dr. Indapal Bhandari, Mr. Subramaniam, uh, Dr. Larry, Dr. Shailesh, Goda, 
and Dr. Zia Sequib. Uh, I'm very grateful to all of them for spending so much of their time with us um, and um, you know, delivering a very enlightening talk. Uh, I wish to thank the management of um, GEO Institute, uh, Dr. Deepak Jain, uh, Dr. Palak Shet, Dr. Uh, G. Ravichandran, um, for providing all the support and encouragement which was needed to make this uh, project happen. Uh, my thanks also go to Ritu. She's the one who, uh, Ritu and Deepti, her colleague, uh, both of them have uh, done this and run this program so effectively. Thank you so much. Thanks to uh, Rakesh and team, the uh, team which ensured that we had more than a thousand people who registered for this conference, 1000 people, and um, more than 400 were attending at several points in time over here today. Uh, I wish to thank Bharat, Harshita, and Clayston. They put in a lot of effort uh, to encourage students also and coordinated with the students and the faculty and the timetable to ensure there are no conflicts, thanks to them. Uh, thanks to my faculty colleagues, um, Dr. Ronak Shodhan uh, and Dr. Sudipto Roy, who also provided a lot of encouragement, support, and helped me at various times during this whole uh, effort. Uh, thanks to the students, all of you, uh, who have participated and attended. We'll have a lot more of such things, very good learning opportunities for everyone. And thanks to all the participants who are from all around India and the world. Thank you for joining us uh, on behalf of GEO Institute. Um, I thank you once again, and I'd like to invite you to come to our Institute and participate uh, in several other programs uh, that will soon follow. Thank you so much and have a wonderful day. Thank you again. Thank you, everyone. Um, have a wonderful day, night, evening. Good day to everyone.